the Diesel Podcast. Digital integration in English as a second or other language. Episode 52, interview with Dr. Katie Topple. Welcome to Diesel. This is episode 52. We are your hosts. I am Brent Warner. And I'm Michelle Reyes. Hey, Brent. Hey, how's it going? It's going. I think by the time you hear this episode, I'll be overseas recovering from jet lag. Yes. Um, I hope that's going okay for you. Are you allowed to say where you are? Not until I'm physically there. Okay, so this is a little bit of a pre-recorded episode. So many secrets around Ishel. Um That's fine, but we'll we'll worry about that a little bit later. Uh, so maybe that means in the November episodes, people will be able to hear where you are. <laughs> All right. Um, so a lot going on. I think we should just uh, jump right into it um, and because we're excited and we've got a lot to talk about with Katie Topple. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on today. Yeah, we we're lucky we're we're getting um we're getting you. I know that you're super busy, yeah. <laughs> and it's the I think when we're recording this, this is you said it's the second week of instruction, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So before we go too far, um, let's properly introduce Katie for uh, for anyone who somehow is not aware of, of you and your work. Um, Ishelle, if you've got uh, you're you're better at doing bios than I am, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Dr. Katie Topple is a language specialist serving multilingual learners in Oregon. She is a co-founder and leader of MLL Chat Book Club on Twitter and co-author of the book DIYPD, A Guide to Self-Directed Learning for Educators of Multilingual Learners, along with Carol Salva and Tan Nguyen. And we've had Carol on the show, so we're super excited. Yeah. We see a lot of, of uh, sharings from you on Twitter, of course. Um, and I, we're going to have to get, uh, the trifecta ten win. Carol <laughs> was our first really. guest on the show. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so we'll have to, we'll have to round that out in the, in the near future. Hopefully, uh, Tan, if you're listening, we would love to have you come on and talk. I know we've quoted him on the show quite a bit yeah. as well. <laughs> Katie, how are you doing? I am very well, a little tired from starting school. It's been a very, very busy two weeks, but it's exciting to be back in action and see kids and be with kids because that's why we do what we do. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that's great about having you on the show is you're the first person, I think, who works with truly littles, right? Like the, the littlest of the little kids yep. uh, getting everything on. We've had a few guests who have talked with, you know, elementary school and different levels, you know, three, four, five and things like that. But you're right down there at the beginning with uh, kindergarten, right? Yeah. And so we wanted to hear before we get too into everything, we just want to hear like how those first uh, couple weeks are going for you. Cause I know that you have transitioned back into uh, physical, like you're, you're, you're in person together with your kids. And so um, how's that going? What are you feeling like? Uh, what are you, what are you hearing from your other teachers? Um, I don't, yeah. Just what's that life like right now? It's very busy. In the spring, our school was at half capacity. So we had cohort, a, co a morning cohort and an afternoon co cohort. Class sizes were about 10 to 12 kids. Um, now we have everybody back. So the school is at full capacity and we are trying to have kids maintain distancing and wear masks and it's, it's a lot. We have lunch outside and especially for our brand new kindergarten students who have never been in school before, that's, there's just a lot of procedures and routines that kids have to learn. And we also have some students who have not been physically in the school since March of 2020. So that's also just a lot of time off from being in the building and all of those things that we need to teach like bathroom procedures and limited numbers of kids in the bathroom and, you know, um, being distance at lunch and all the little things like you have to put your mask on before you can walk towards the trash can to throw out your extra things at lunch. There's just, there's a lot, it's very busy. Um, it's kind of an all hands on deck scenario. Classroom teachers have been teaching since kids set foot in the building, but some of the specialists have been, um, helping a lot with duty because our services don't start quite yet. So I don't start actually teaching until tomorrow. Oh, 
I've been testing. (laughs) I've been testing incoming kindergarten students and just supporting, helping kids get to classrooms, making sure everybody knows where to go, helping with lunch duty, helping with um, dismissal duty, things like that too, to try to make sure that we can just keep kids safe and keep things going. That is a ton of work. (laughs) Even before you start teaching and and having the daily classes, that's going to keep you plenty busy. So, um, but I'm sure you're also looking forward to working with the kids. Um, And so a lot of what we're, uh, you know, we talk about technology and those types of things and how you're, how you're dealing with kids. Uh, Is technology a part of this process now when you're like onboarding kids and bringing them into school and working with them on a daily basis? Um, How are you, uh, or, or are you just kind of, like saying we've looked at enough screens where we just want to kind of uh, uh, just talk and, and work with each other. How, is, how has that worked out for you? Well, something that's really important to remember is that we don't know if and when we will have to pivot to at-home instruction. Um, we already do have children in schools nationwide who are quarantining. And so when that happens, they still need to learn. They still need instruction. And so technology remains a really integral piece of equipment that students need. At my school, we have one-on-one iPads. And so even though we really want kids writing paper and pencil, and we really want kids holding actual books, there are still some limitations to what can be shared and things like that. And we need to make sure that students understand what they will need to do in the event that they have to stay home. So we use, um, Canvas as our learning platform and students need to understand how to access things that their teachers put on there in the event that they are learning from home temporarily. Or if we switch, who knows? (laughs) It feels like this year is going to be as much of a roller coaster as last year. And we simply don't know if we will remain in the building the whole year. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So technology, yeah, I've been, I've been using, um, the kindergarten students have been taking a screener test to see if they qualify as English language learners for um, language development services. And um, there's been a lot of um, assessment to see where kids are because last year and the spring of 2020 was a doozy. So we are evaluating where are kids because we need to know how we can meet them where they are. We have kids that are not necessarily, you know, quote unquote at, at grade level. Um, so we're a lot of teachers are doing that work right now to investigate. And that does involve some, um, you know, diagnostic testing using iPads and various programs to see where kids are. So we know how we can support them. So, Katie, um, I hear you talking about something that I, I constantly think about. Um, I'm right now face to face. But when we switch to face to face, and half of us had to go immediately back to digital instruction and back and forth. So until right now, it's kind of a mix. Um, but how with language learners, how what kind of um, allow um, I don't want to call them allowances, but what kind of grace are you um, as teachers giving the students who aren't at the level that they're supposed to be for, you know, in, la- in language? Um I don't think that, at uh, like you said, last year or the last year and a half, um, you could learn as much as, as fast of pace as you normally would. So what, when we are assessing students now, what um, do we look for and not immediately like say, oh, you're, you're failing or you're not where you're supposed to be? Like what, what is that for like for you right now? So I think, you know, there is a lot of, worry from teachers because, you know, we are used to getting kids incoming with a certain set of skills and moving forward. And so it's, it is very challenging and very uncomfortable to be in a place of really not knowing what to do. And I think that that is a sentiment shared by a lot of educators right now is I don't feel confident in knowing what to do. And so I think it's really just, uh, my district has a couple of mottos for this year. And um, one of them is, this comes from our superintendent, think big, but act small. And it's small steps forward because there are a lot of new things 
and it's, I know, unprecedented times, it's overused, but it, it really is something that I've been in education for 16 years. It's nothing I've ever seen and it's new. And so as competent as you typically feel, the beginning of the year is always hard, but this is harder. Um, and it may be the hardest that some of us in our careers deal with because we don't have a clear path of moving forward because we simply we're still trying to figure out really where kids are and what we can do. And unfortunately it really does come with a lot of kind of deficit oriented ideas, you know, and that it's, it really does require, I try very hard to take a step back and say, you know, what is in my control and what can I help? And the one thing that I really try to focus on is I can make kids feel like I'm super excited that they're at school. I can make kids or support kid, not make them support <laughs> kids and understanding how smart they are and how wonderful it is that they are bilingual or multilingual and that that's an asset that they bring. That's really exciting because that makes their brain actually bigger and smarter. Maybe um, I, you know, I just try to pump them up because um, you know, I heard a teacher say the other day, a student said, well, I can't read. And that makes me sad. And it just makes me want to sit down. That's a student I'll work with and say, so what are we going to do about this? Like, let, let's set some goals. Here's, here's, here's what we can do. Tell me what's hard. And I'm going to figure out how to help you. That's my job. I'm here to help you and give them that, that assurance that we're going to grow. And at this point, we can't do anything about where students are starting. It is what it is. I mean, there are so many factors last year that affected kids' ability to engage, so many. And we have to kind of set that aside and just look at what we have and move forward. And it can be small steps. And we may not make three years worth of growth. We may not make a full year's worth of growth. But to me, what really matters the most is that the students that we work with just know that they're so loved and know that we believe in them. I think those are really important things. That's where we have to start. And Katie, you mentioned that and it, you know, it makes me think of um, fostering resiliency in children mm -hmm. and just in people in general. But I was listening to an episode uh, where you talked about, this was an episode in um, Carol Salva's um, podcast uh we'll have to link the episode in the show in the show notes but you talked about uh starting off uh with a routine of when you went back i think it, you said it was face-to-face -face routine of or of asking um kids uh, i think i was mentioning something that they were that they liked or that that was positive and you and there was a story there where you said the kids would say um i am loved mm -hmm. by my teacher yeah, we started to do affirmations. Last year, I took right. a year-long PLC with Zaretta Hammond. It was a virtual a virtual program, mm -hmm. um, and it was culturally responsive education by design. And fantastic. Highly recommend. And one of the things she talked about was the power of a ritual and that kids really thrive when they know what to expect. Um, I imagine going into some of my kinders going into a school where they are not understanding the language coming at them constantly and the adults all have their faces covered. And I imagine feel I, I understand completely why some of them are crying. It breaks my heart, but it's it's very overwhelming. Um, so knowing what to expect kind of adds to that sense of comfort. And um, Zaretta talks about just having a ritual. So I started in my, my groups last year doing affirmations. And it was a simple set of statements that I would read and each student would choose one and say it out loud. And it was things like, I am bilingual or I am multilingual. I am loved. My teachers care about me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a good friend my voice matters. I'm an important part of this group. And the kids seem to really like it. And it, it felt powerful to me, especially when we dug a little bit into what that means to be bilingual. And they started to say, I'm bilingual. I speak English and Chukis, or I'm bilingual. I know English and Spanish. And that was powerful. I thought. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Because that, that approach to, I mean, kind of what you were bringing back from before is you're saying like so many people are out there complaining about like loss, learning loss and you know, all these other things. And it's like, 
can we just start with supporting the people who need, who need this level of support? We can worry about some of those things later. People are resilient. Children are resilient. They can figure things out and get those opportunities. But um, I, I, I really appreciate that that first approach is just like loving and supporting the students and making sure that they are getting what they need um, at, a, at a core level before you have to worry about all the whatever it might be state requirements or, or those types of things that kind of overwhelm sometimes. Yeah. And I think, I mean, one of the things that personally I love about being a language specialist compared to being a classroom teacher is classroom teachers have a lot of things on their plate and they're, they're getting the message of, you know, we need to, we need to be meeting standards. We need to be meeting grade level expectations. There's a lot of pressure and, I feel as a specialist, I have this lucky role where when I come in to co-teach, I can have these little moments with kids and I'm not in, in certain moments. I mean, in these first two weeks coming or that we just had, um, when I come in, I'm not leading the class. I'm kind of observing and checking things out and getting the feel of how things are going. And so I can kind of, you know, come as close as I can up to a student and have a little conversation with them and kind of try to connect with them because I'm not managing the whole class in that moment. And classroom teachers just, I mean, the, the teachers I work with are so phenomenal. They have so much on their plates and I can absolutely relate to why they feel that that pressure about learning loss. And they feel that because that's the reality of kind of the pressure that is on them. And that's why I'm so passionate about co-teaching and collaborating because I try to frame my role as I'm here to support you. And if you have 15 things on your plate, what, what can I take? What can I support with? How can I make your, your plate smaller? Let's share what can I do? Um, and I think that that's so key right now because teachers want to be superheroes. We want to be able to do everything and we can't, and we, we, can't, we absolutely can't. So we need to work together and we need to divide and conquer and say, you do this, I'll do this and let's share because it's a matter of kind of keeping, keeping our own mental health and sanity this year, especially this year to be able to just really accomplish what we need to do. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit, Katie, about your co-teaching setup? Because I think that's, you know, n not every teacher gets that, um, you know, like is able to be in a situation like that, right? Some, some people are coming from, I am the only teacher of all of the kids in this whole, you know, school and some for some of our teachers who are overseas and some setups like that too. Um, what is that co-teaching set up? Uh, how is, how is that set up? And then, um, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis when you go in as a co-teacher? So I initially started with one grade level because with co-teaching, it's really important to have, have buy-in and interest from the classroom teachers. It's not something that works if it's forced upon mm -hmm. anyone. <laughs> so we started with one team and the idea was to just eventually add a grade level each year. That didn't work out as we had initially planned, but we're I think on year five and I'm now adding third grade. So I'm doing kindergarten, I'm doing first grade, I'm doing third grade. And it, we're still in the stages, at least with third grade of figuring out what it's going to look like. Cause we've never done it before. Um, but it's really, I try to go in and see what would benefit students where language is important in their day. Of course it's important across the whole day, but what would be kind of a reasonable time to come in and share in that content and language instruction and we just really, we literally build the plane while we're on it. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are systems that we've learned. We've learned a ton from Andrea Honigsfeld and Maria Dub in all of their amazing books. Um, this year we had a, a district training on co-teaching. So we understand that there's co-planning, there's co-teaching, there's co-reflecting and there's co-assessing. There's a whole system and it's very much trial and error. What works? And I try to normalize with teams. Please don't feel like you'll hurt my feelings. If you didn't like the way something went, it, you know, we, we will adapt. We will figure this out. We set a schedule that we think will work and we're going to try it this week. And we're going to then reflect on how it worked for the students. And if the students on my caseload got sufficient support, or if we need to kind of dial it in a little bit more to be less everybody and more small group instruction. So we're going to see, um, typically, typically when I come in, we, um, 
are implementing lessons where the intention is to explicitly focus on language and to swirl. And that acronym means that we are speaking, writing, interactive, interacting, reading, and listening. So it's integrating all of the language domains in a single lesson um, to make sure that students are, when they're learning whatever the content is, they are able to read about it, write about it, speak about it, interact with partners, um, and understand the oral input that is coming to them. So that's kind of one of the, the key focuses we have because in co-teaching, I'm not seeing every class every day. I'm seeing classes I alternate. And so I want to make sure that when I'm there, we're really, we're, we're getting the most out of that lesson time. So Katie, um, so now going, going back to how, what tools you're using to um, facilitate um, sharing of the material that Mm -hmm. students create, what are some of the tools that you're using and um, how do you apply that with our, with our language learners? So one of our go-to tools is the app Seesaw. We've been using it for a couple of years and it is basically, if you're not familiar with what Seesaw is, it's like a digital portfolio. So every child has their own account and it allows them to um, complete activities that the teacher sends and it all kind of stay, it's like a portfolio that they, where all of their work resides. Um, the reason I love that is because when I'm in and out of classrooms, I don't necessarily have the time to document what, Jose said, and then what Maribel said, and then I I don't take the time to write it down. So when students can complete the lesson by interacting in an activity in Seesaw, it's, it's archiving that language. And so then I can go back when it's time to say, ooh, how are students doing with these standards? Or I have to do report card grades, things like that. I've got this, um, this record of their work to be able to kind of track their progress. And it's just so wonderful to be able to listen to what they've said and to have each child accountable for that output, whether it's speaking or um, drawing or writing or whatever it is that we're asking them. It's that individual accountability that our, our multilingual students are not invisible and quiet in our classrooms. I used to teach kindergarten as the classroom teacher. And I remember certain students just, I don't, I don't think I had the tools to really support them that I know about now and the skill level. And when it would be time to write, it's a blank page because they, they didn't know. And I didn't support them and scaffold it so that they could produce something. And the expectation is so different now that every, everyone can do it because we've scaffolded, we've given visuals, we've given them the tools, we've practiced. So by the time they're doing something on Seesaw, they're very competent to be able to do it independently or with a little bit of adult assistance, but um, we've prepared them. But Seesaw provides opportunities to record language, provides opportunities to write or draw digitally. They can type, they can listen to teacher recorded directions or snippets or whatever it is that you want to provide. So there's so much versatility in how the teacher can support and also what the students can do to demonstrate their language or their content understanding. It's, I can't even say enough good things about Seesaw. I love it. (laughs) So, and Katie with Seesaw and I have not used it. I mean, I've been aware of it peripherally for many years, but um, so you're saying that uh, Seesaw is, I guess, like visually and tactically uh, accessible for even down to kindergarten kindergartners? Yes, absolutely. It is not intended to be a tool for distance learning. However, last year, we used it that way because it was it's it's a tool that's very appropriate for our youngest learners. So I had students who via Google Meets, we got them logged in. First graders typing in passwords. I mean, they're fun, it is phenomenal what children accomplished last year. Um, I got all of my kindergartners set up on Seesaw and then we would do an activity together. And then I would show them using, um, I used the Osmo to kind of mirror what I was, I would either mirror my iPad screen or use the Osmo as kind of a document camera so they could see what I was moving around, um, trying to mimic what we would typically do in a classroom. But they would then do their Seesaw activity at home. And it was such a great way for me to have evidence of what they can do, not with my help. Mm. 
um, what they can do by their, by themselves. And it's so easy to make it age appropriate. For example, I can create an activity with four pictures from a story and they can manipulate the pictures to put them in the correct order. And then they can click the microphone and they can retell the story and I can give them support and scaffold in that, or they can do that without support and scaffold. But for a kindergarten child, having that ability to manipulate and move things around and it's, it's just really, really easy. And they learned it so well. And the exciting thing is that the, the classroom teachers didn't use it. So this year, my multilingual learners as first graders are the experts in Seesaw. So I talked to one student at lunch and I said, next week, you're going to get to use Seesaw in first grade with your teacher and me. And I said, but some of the other kids haven't used it yet. So do you think you can be a helper? And her face lit. She was so excited to be able to be an expert on something that the other kids don't know how to do yet. So I, I love that. And I've had that experience with some of my students too, when I was, when I was first teaching Google docs and you know, none, none of the other teachers at our school really knew about Google docs. And then the, they'd come in and they're like, no, you're not doing it right. This is how you use it. It's like, it's such an empowering thing for them to be yeah. able to do that. And then to talk about it in English too, and tell a teacher or tell another classmate, like how, how it works. Um, I really, you know, like, I, I love that. Um, I do want to kind of go back. So you were, because you're talking about, um, having students put in passwords or, or having them do that and maybe using an Osmo cam. Um, can you talk, can you talk us through just like the actual nuts and bolts? Because for me, even now with adults, I'll be like, I can't, you know, it's so much harder for me not sitting next to you or not like being able to like point to things. And yeah. like, how are you, what is your, your, your step-by-step -step process for like how you teach these kids to use the technology when you, because we still have some people who are not able to sit next to their kids, right? They're still sure. online. How, how do you yeah. actually do that without being next to them? So my setup was my laptop where I would connect to my Google Meet. I also had a, a separate screen. And that was just so that if I'm sharing something, I can see it on my screen. I didn't always need it, but my husband is very techy, So he set me up. Um, and then I also had my, I have a, an iPad, my teacher iPad from school. And so I would connect to Seesaw on my iPad and share my screen with students in the Google meet so they could see everything that I was doing and having, I, I think it's an accessibility feature that you can have a specific pointer on the iPad screen mm -hmm. so that you can move it so they can really track where you're looking. Because if you're saying, click this, click this, it is, it is so hard because you don't know what they're seeing and they maybe don't understand what you're saying. So being able to physically move that pointer and say, look, this is where you're going to click right here. Touch that helps a lot for them to focus in on what you're asking them to do. A lot of times the youngest learners do need parent assistant assistance. And that also requires supporting parents and understanding what to do because not all parents are like, Oh sure. Yeah. Okay. Password did it. It's if there's um, another language used in the home and you're trying to give technology directions, that's a barrier. I know for myself, I, I do speak Spanish. It is far from perfect, but I learned a lot of technology vocabulary in Spanish through hearing the interpreters explain things in various meetings. Like I didn't know how to say screen. I didn't know how to say password. I didn't know how to say link. And now I've learned all those things. So the technology is a vocab, like it's, it's vocabulary on its own to learn all those things. So it was not easy, but the students and their parents worked so hard and there were so many successes. And I think it's important to celebrate all of those, the, you know, the bumps, but that we, we were able to do a lot because um, parent communication was really important and that was part of success is me messaging parents and, and saying, can you do this? This is, you know, here's a video how, or sometimes I would screen record the instructions and say it in Spanish in my best attempt at Spanish to, to show them visually how to do it. I think that's a, a, a huge thing for language learners is the visual. You can't just say it, you have to show it and show it slowly and be clear with the steps and, and all of those things help. Yeah, you know, I didn't even, it didn't even dawn on me that I could use the accessibility feature to do that because, uh, you know, even with adults and um, especially language learners um, that may come from a country where you're not used to uh, using a browser or, 
even checking email often. That's a whole procedure. And also, you know, entering passwords. But I that never dawned on me that I could try to, uh, you know, look through the settings because that would have would have made it a lot easier for some of my students who I've I've had students who didn't know how to use a mouse or um, you know just logging into the computer and then logging into a browser and then logging into something else that you know you're right by saying click here that doesn't always make it clear. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Katie, we've also got uh, you know. Tons of stuff we can keep talking about with kids, but we also want to talk about your work with teachers, right? And your new book coming out as well. So, um, so I, I love this title. When I saw, it, I'm like, oh, nice! <laughs> it's DIY PD: A Guide to Self-Directed Learning for Educators of Multilingual Learners. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this because I think a lot of teachers, especially in our uh, field, and maybe maybe this has changed more over the last year, year and a half, of course, because we're forced on the computers. But a lot of uh, you know um, ELTs are you know, like don't have, haven't always known of ways to pursue their own professional development, or they feel like the only way that I can do this is if I go to a TESOL conference once a year, and that's the only time I'm going to learn anything. Right. Um, now, of course we know <laughs> that that's not really true. Um, uh, not true at all. Uh, there's so many resources out there, but, um, I want to kind of, I want to talk about this and like, you know, share what you're uh you're looking at what you're trying to offer to people or let people know about um and uh you know see where where you got started with this and and how uh how people have been responding to it as well sure um so a little background carol salva ton win and i wrote this book together and we met on twitter um or we connected i guess we'll say on twitter and it I, there's so much power just in that the, it, of having this place, this virtual place where you can connect with people who are not necessarily in your geographic location, your country and learning from them and communicating with them and collaborating in order to, to learn. Um, something that I think we've heard from a lot of teachers in our field, in the field of um teaching language learners and multilingual students is that the professional development that is provided to us doesn't necessarily meet our specific needs or fulfill that passion we have for learning. Um, There's a lot of professional development that's necessary, things that we need to learn in order to move forward and to understand the systems and curricula and things that are in place and there's room for a lot of more nuanced and specific professional learning that feeds our soul and feeds what we want for our students and more specifically addresses the needs of students who are multilingual learners. Um, So over the years of really just starting on Twitter, I think the three of us found so much power in all of the different opportunities and ways to learn. I know, and I know we're going to get into talking about MLL Chat Book Club also. MLL Chat Book Club has been the source of the majority of my professional learning around serving multilingual learners. And the fact that the authors who write the books that we read are on Twitter also and willing to interact and willing to support us in our learning feels like, wait, is this really happening? Mm -hmm. Because normally, like you said, Brent, you go to a conference and you pay a lot of money to go to a conference. Sometimes there aren't funds available to teachers. And so it's out of pocket expense. I know for me, I love going to conferences. I'm in my zone to go to a conference. I also have two children at home and a partner who works. And it's not always easy to just say, okay, well, I'm going to go to I'm going to go to another state for a couple of days and learn, um, you know, that involves taking time off from work and then writing sub plans. And there, there can be a lot to it. Going to a conference is a hugely valuable experience. And there are other things that you can also do if that's something that's not available to you. So that's kind of the, the spark and the idea for our book is that there are a lot of opportunities that are available to you and they're not all expensive they're not all 
one and done so that you do it and then you you move on. Our goal is really to find opportunities that help you connect with as many people in the field as possible, um, that you have opportunities that are associated with a cost that's reasonable to you. And many of them are free. Um, and that there's community involved and that there's continuity involved so that there's kind of this continuous learning and growing together, that it's not something that just ends and you're on your own. Um, and really, I, I can honestly say that Twitter was the foundation for my professional growth in terms of connecting with other people who do what I do. There are many teachers, like you mentioned before, Brent, who might be the only language teacher in a school or maybe even in a larger um, con- you know, district of schools that don't feel connected to other people who do what they do. And there are a lot of teachers in our field who feel isolated, who feel like they work in a silo. Um, and that's not a good feeling. So our goal is to connect people and to engage in learning with others and really to be able to say, you know what? I really want to learn about choice boards. I want my students to have choice. Okay. I'm going to tweet this out and I'm going to find somebody who can help me. And it's, it's really self-directed is the key because there are things that we can decide for ourselves that we need. And that involves a lot of self-reflection of, you know what? I want to try co-teaching. It's not being presented to me right now as an option, or maybe it is, but I don't have a lot of tools and I need help. So I'm going to go out and find them. And that, that is a reality, honestly, through Twitter and other social media avenues um, and just as a result of becoming connected with people in the field, because there are so many giving people who are willing to help and give advice or provide resources. And it's kind of just a matter of learning how to navigate it in order to have so much at our fingertips. Yeah, we, Michelle and I talk about that quite a bit because we're, because we met over over Twitter, mm-hmm. and you know we we have the same relationship too. Um, even though we weren't uh, at that time, we weren't very far far away from each other, and we we would run each other, run into each other at conferences or those types of things. But it is super powerful, right? Because you you get that chance, and it's like I don't have to go to the event and make you know every you know like maybe you know I am you know. Michelle says uh, <laughs> she's super introverted and I am somewhat introverted. Um, but, uh, you know, like maybe we wouldn't have talked as much if it wasn't for some opportunity like Twitter, right? Where it's like, oh, now we've got these, oh, little, sure. these little points that we're, we're kind of touching base on. And, and then we're able to flip that and grow that into something else there too. So um, I think that's really valuable. And and I also talk about the same thing with conferences is, as much as I love them too, kind of the same way you're talking about, Katie, is... I am usually not willing to take time off and leave my students in order to go do <laughs> that conference. And so when they do these midweek conferences, okay, we're going to have a conference from Monday to Thursday. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is, so I have to either choose between going to the conferences or serving my students directly. Um, I, I, I'm going to choose my students, you know, like, and, and so I real that's why I really love this idea of doing PD on your own or kind of working it out on yourself. And of course there are many conferences that do weekends, so I'm not, not saying mm-hmm. everywhere, but um, so can you share a little bit? Um, let's, let's talk about like one or two of the free, uh, the free things that people could do right now just to kind of start building for themselves. Okay. One, what we're doing right now, podcasts. I listen to podcasts on my way to work, not every day. Maybe that's not something I wanna do Monday through Friday, but I often will listen to Carol and Tom. They have wonderful podcasts. Yours is another example of a podcast where you can just in your commute, get some great knowledge and information that you can incorporate. And it's something that I'm spending time in the car anyway, or maybe I'm spending time at the end of my evening cleaning the kitchen and emptying the dishwasher and making my kids lunches. And I can have an expert in my ear sharing information. And that's, that's a great way to just access information. And it might spark an area of curiosity, or it might answer a question you've been having, or it might just give you more information or a book to read or another idea, another person to follow on Twitter. There's just so much. 
and it's, it's not, there's not a cost and it doesn't necessarily, I mean, you can do it from your home. It's flexible. That's one of our main goals is that flexibility because, um, to just touch back to the idea of a conference, like everybody has their own ideas of what works. And our intention is never to say, well, let's get rid of this kind of PD in favor of this, that right. everything has value. It's just a matter of what works and when and how you can individually navigate it. So we try to really encourage fl- flexibility so that it's going to work for busy teachers because there's not a lot of time. And I know that even in starting on Twitter, which is free, um, there would be chats and they would happen at five o'clock in my time zone. And I had toddlers at the time and I really wanted to participate. And then not good things would happen (laughs) if mom is focused on Twitter while the game, you know, it's, and it's dinner time. I have to make dinner. I have to do all these things. And so that's where my idea came of, I want to do this, but I want to be able to, to, give my input at any time of day, you know, maybe it's in the middle of the night when um, I wake up and I can't sleep, or maybe it's once the kids are tucked in bed, or maybe it's first thing in the morning when I'm having my coffee. And so that flexibility is wonderful. Um, So one free avenue is podcasts. Another that is um, often free is webinars. So the idea of a conference can be expensive. And once we kind of went into teaching during the pandemic, webinars really became widespread. Um, Companies like Corwin offer a Monday afternoon webinar series where their book authors will share content from books and it's free. You register and then get the link and you can attend when it's happening live or often if you can't make it, you can get the link and watch later. Um, I know time zones can be an issue. So I have learned just sign up. Even if you don't think you can go, just sign up and a lot, not every time, but most often you will receive the link so you can watch it at your convenience. Um, And those, those things don't have a cost to them. So uh, not only can you save some money, but you can also have choice in what webinar really affects you. What is really going to connect and be relevant to your daily work with students Um, same with, with podcasts and there's just, there's a lot out there. That's one of the things that we had to kind of learn is there's so much you have to learn what connects to your need or your interests and kind of filter so that you can focus on things that really work for you and really inform your practice. Yeah. And as, as Brent and I both know, once you find a resource or a person that you that you really connect with when you're listening, it's like they will introduce you via their resources to other like-minded individuals. And so then it just, you know, it's an explosion of, of PD, free PD that you have out there accessible. Um, So Katie, as we're getting closer to the end of the show, I want to make sure that we talk about the book club um, Mm -hmm. because that's one of, you know, that's, that's, I think that's how I first heard about you through Brent and of course through Carol, but that's most of the posts that I get that pop up on my Twitter are the book club. And so if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. When I first became a language specialist, we did not co-teach and I had a colleague that said we, we should co-teach and we didn't know anything about it. And I saw Andrea Honigsfeld and Maria Dove's book, one of their books about co-teaching. And I tweeted a picture of the cover and I said, I, I'm going to read this now. I want to, I need to learn about co-teaching. I'm going to read this. And Tan tweeted back, let's, let's read, let's both read it and tweet about it. Like, let's have a, it was basically an online book club. And we're like, okay, well, let's have a hashtag so that we can, you know, keep it organized. And Tan said, how about ELL Chat Book Club? Okay. And that was literally it. Like, let's read a book at the same time and let's use Twitter as a a platform to share our thoughts. And just, it kind of organically grew of, okay, well, let's have a, a reading schedule so that we're kind of focusing on the same part at the same time. And then we would have some questions for discussion. And sometimes they come right from the book. A lot of authors embed reflection questions in their texts. And sometimes it's questions that we would kind of think of together that would be relevant for teachers to reflect on or discuss. And basically that was it. The idea was tweet whenever you can. Um, It wasn't tied to a certain time zone or a certain geographic location because Don was in 
I forget where he was at the, I think he was in Laos at the time. So there's not probably going to be a time of day where we could chat live because we're busy working. And so kind of the asynchronous piece on Twitter was really cool. And it just authentically grew even in the first round, Andrea Honigsfeld chimed in and she was the author and that blew our minds. Cause I always put authors on a pedestal like, Oh my God, it's Andrea. <laughs> and it, authors are excited and interested to engage with people who are interested in their work mm -hmm. and they are interested in sharing their expertise and talking to people about what they wrote about. If you write a book about something, you like to talk about it. You're very interested in it. So it was kind of this realization that authors want to interact too. And that was really cool. And it just, we started to move from one book to another. The book chat really goes year round. And sometimes I, um, I'll ask for suggestions and, and participants can vote. So that way the book that's chosen is kind of the majority vote. Sometimes a great new book comes out and I say, we're reading this. This is going to be, it. it's going to be awesome. And I just announce this is what we're doing. Um, and then recently we shifted from ELL chat book club to MLL chat book club, just to reflect what um, the discussion in the field that, using the term multilingual learners is more inclusive and does not um, place English as the emphasis of what students need to have, but really MLL, um, multilingual learner values, the languages that students have with their families and at home, in addition to um, learning English in the classroom. Um, but the, the book chat has really grown and it's amazing over the years. I think we've been doing it since November of 2016. So, we're coming up on five years. Did I do that math yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we've done over 30 book studies. We've had so many authors and experts in the field participate. And it's just a wonderful opportunity to learn kind of from your own home at your own convenience. And we also say, even if you don't have the book, I recognize that buying all the books can add up cost wise, but you can learn just by reading what people are saying. And there's other layers. We now have people that sketch note what they learn from the books or create graphics or, um, you know, maybe there's a podcast episode where the author talks about it. So there's different layers. And that's really what our book is about is finding those different ways. We have a chapter about, um, or a section about layering your learning together. Mm -hmm. So it's not just reading the book, but it's reading it and then connecting on Twitter to talk to others and engage with the author and experts in the field. And then maybe it is listening to a podcast about it, or maybe it's finding a, a novel where the main character is has a similar background to a student you teach to really gain insight into what some of our students go through and then layering that in with your understanding of your practice and pedagogy and how to meet the needs of learners and there's just there's so many different things to do to learn so much there's so many opportunities out there and we've kind of organized our book in um, according to the different domains like we know that it used to be called receptive learning and expressive now we call it interpretive and expressive and interactive so we've kind of layered it and i love that you mentioned that the two of you are a little introverted because i am too totally connect to that <laughs> and one of the things that that i remember writing myself is sometimes you need that time to just reflect on your own before you're ready to engage with other people and so there are a lot of avenues that just allow for a person independently to learn and process and, and think and formulate new ideas and weave the new in with what they already do. And then there's opportunities to be expressive in that, to, to write about it or sketch note about it or draw about it. And there's opportunities to then interact with other people and maybe collaborate on a project or collaborate on presenting. There's, there's a lot of different avenues and, um, something that I've learned is that when you decide to present at a conference, sometimes that comes with free admission. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about how cost can be a barrier to going to a conference, if you're willing to put yourself out there and present about an idea that you have or something you're doing in your classroom, that might help financially with, with being able to attend the conference because some organizations gift you that admission fee if, you, if you're a presenter. Yeah, that's a, a whole nother conversation. I've, I've gotten into that conversation a few times. My belief is that 
every organization should cover you if you're going to be a presenter for them. But, um, <laughs> but uh, one thing I kind of wanted just to, as, as we're wrapping up and talking about this, um, you know, I love that it's on Twitter and that there's a hashtag for it because we might not be able, like you said, to read every book or, or, or get everything, but also it's an archive, right? And so even mm-hmm. even if I I am a month or a year late to late mm-hmm. to, to uh, when I whenever I get around to reading this book, I can say, hey, I have some thoughts on this. I want to go either see what other people are talking about on this book, and I can go back and see in um, ML uh, Chat Book Club or or in ELL. So go and uh, find you know double check on both the hashtags, I guess, for it. But yeah. then you can go see a bunch of other teachers who have also been talking about that same thing, right? And I love that it's available mm-hmm. at any time. Now, do people come back to older book like you're done with this book, and do people still comment on previous books as well? What I've had more often is a, an educator within a certain district contact me and say, I want to do a book study on this one. And it might be a book from years ago. Uh, um, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain is a really popular one. We did that maybe in our, our, within our first year, it was around like five or six or something early on. Um, And I have all of the rounds archived also on a blog Um, And that way I can direct someone to there and they can access the questions that we had, or I can't remember if all of the rounds are on there. It's some, as I said, things kind of grew and we're in a place now where it's really slick. There's an interactive notebook with all the information. And so at least for recent rounds, the interactive notebook for every round we've done recently is right in the blog. So somebody can go and look and they can have a great idea of how to organize that for their own colleagues. They have examples of questions they can use. They have examples of a reading schedule. So they can kind of take that and run with it in their own context where maybe they are doing a face-to-face Facebook study with colleagues in a certain school or within a certain organization. Awesome. Yeah, so. we're going we're gonna to have to include that. Um, one of the things that I had to do this year is um, teach a class I hadn't taught before, of course, and it was a TOEFL prep class uh, for higher ed students. Um, but a lot of the topics, of course, with it being language prep, um, had to do with uh, stuff we learned in podcasts. And the number one place I would go to is Twitter and then search and then see which of my call, well, my PLN colleagues uh, had posted either links to videos or, or had tweeted to the author or uh, the speaker. And then I had immediate um resources where, you know, my institution didn't have those for me, but they were there. And so I I love that we can always plug in those things that we can do. And then furthermore, then you become sort of a little expert on it. And as you said, it going to a conference now you can present and even sometimes it makes you better at knowing who you're going to go see because now you know who to seek when you're at the conference rather than just, you know, being overwhelmed, especially if you're new um, in conferences. But those of us who thrive at um, attending those PD sessions, it makes you a better, uh, you can discern um, better what to attend and how to scaffold your own. Yeah. And that's kind of an overarching theme of our book is that that term self-directed, that it's really, it's each educator thinking deeply about what they know, what they want to know, where to find these things and and navigating it so that, I mean, to, for me, that's what keeps my, my heart in it because I'm so passionate and excited when I get to choose. Mm-hmm. And there's, it, there's, there's a different feeling of being assigned something and feeling like you are responsible for making a choice based on something that really is an interest for you or really something that will help your specific students that you're connected to. Absolutely. There's so much cool stuff to be able to pursue it. And Katie, I feel like we could keep on talking, but let's jump out and uh, jump over to Fun Finds. Okay, it is time for our Fun Finds. And this time around, I uh, found this app. It's called Vocal Extractor. And if you're into music and karaoke, uh, sometimes you can't find just the track without the words. Uh, to your favorite song. And I have this favorite song that 
again, I'm not a good singer or anything. I just do it because it's fun. And I really wanted to try to sing that song, uh, but I couldn't do it with the vocals. So this app just takes any song. I, I, I haven't tried with any other types of tracks, just music, but it isolates the the voice from the backing track. And then you can just save either just the, the vocal track or oh. the 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 musical back uh backing track and then you can do whatever and over i mean if you're overlaying things and doing other stuff i you know i started thinking uh it's kind of a cool thing um it is a paid app but it's worth it's like 2.99 and and i've had a lot of fun uh releasing stress singing to my favorite (laughs) song (laughs) but that is vocal extractor awesome um so mine is uh just a movie, a, a classic movie, a Rear Window, Alfred Hitchcock and uh, Jimmy Stewart. And I just, I, I don't know if I'd, I'd ever seen it before. I just started watching it. Anyways, um, it's a very well-known movie. I don't need to explain <laughs> it very much. But I was just enthralled by watching it because it's it's the way that it's filmed and the way that it's made was like, it's just so interestingly filmed and the way you kind of see little peaks and, and slices into different people's lives inside of there and uh, the reactions and, and, and the way that the story is put together. Um, I was just, uh, you know, it's a classic movie. Ever Anybody who's like a film buff is going to be, uh, you know, questioning my, <laughs> my question i'm like why, why haven't you seen this before but um anyways so uh rear window uh if you just want a an evening off to watch a different uh type of movie I, I don't think that you know there's no other movies that are really quite like it so it's worth a watch alfred hitchcock's original katie uh do you have a fun find yeah so mine is an app and it's called habit And I've said this before on Twitter, if I present as somebody who's very organized, the truth is that I'm not. (laughs) And I, like many people, struggle to kind of just keep all the boxes checked. So um, Habit is a cool app where you can enter in different things that you want to accomplish and you could have daily habits or you could set them for different intervals across the week. And then um, just as you go throughout your day, you can check them off. And it's kind of, if you, if you like to, if you have that comp- competitive sense in you, it, you know, checks it off. It gives you a little award if you do all your habits please. for the day. But for me, honestly, it's things right now, like drink water. Because when I go to school and I have my mask on the whole day, I find that I'm not drinking water. So I've got drink water on there. Take your vitamins, skincare, some of those um, just self-care things that I honestly neglected a lot in the past year. Um, I'm trying to get back on track, exercising. So I'm finding it helpful to use. And it also tells you how many days in a row you have successfully completed that habit. So uh, when I'm like, I don't want to take my vitamins, I look, oh, I've done it for 35 days in a row. I can't break the street. Um, it's just, just helpful to keep a little bit of organization in my life when some, sometimes it feels pretty, pretty busy and overextended right now. Absolutely. A habit app. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You could win a one of a kind diesel pin by leaving us a review on Apple podcasts. And if you're giving us a shout out any other way, tag us on social media. We're on all of them. Uh, we're also on Patreon with our uh, little special bonus episodes available for you as well. Uh, we'll be following up with Katie for a couple of quick questions there. Um, you can find the show notes, all the links to everything we've been talking about here at diesel.org slash 52. Uh, you can also listen to us on Voice Ed Canada. That's V-O-I-C-E-D dot C-A. You can find the show on Twitter at DieselPod, and you can find me at Brent G. Warner. You can find me, Ishal, at IXY underscore PIXY. That's Ixy underscore Pixie. And Katie, where can we find you on Twitter? Um, my handle is at Katie Topple, and it's K-A-T-I-E-T-O-P-P-E-L. And Easy. Katie, where else can people find you? Um, I am on Instagram and that handle is at topple underscore E L D. It is a private account, but I do pretty much (laughs) accept everyone. I just, I prefer to keep it private in the event that I have anything connected to my students on there. 
Awesome. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Katie. We're, we're super excited about all of this and, uh, we hope everybody has, uh, picked up some, some awesome hints and tips and, and ways to kind of approach their classes in the upcoming, uh, well, throughout the rest of the semester and, and moving forward. Thank you so much for having me. It was a fun conversation. In Japanese, thank, thank you very much is domo arigato. Domo arigato for tuning into the DSOL podcast. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Katie.